guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. If you're not, thanks for joining me again for another video in the core concept series. So as a reminder, this is a back to the basic series where we are really trying to understand what is going on in the body so that we can better care for patients with acute and chronic illnesses. So this is the fourth video in the core concept series. I will link the first three videos in the description box below. And do remember that there is a corresponding case study that goes along with each of the core concepts videos, which you can find in my Etsy shop, which I will also link in the description box below. So let's get started. Today, we are going to talk about pain and comfort, very foundational, basic human needs. And let's start with comfort. So comfort is a state of physical well-being. It's the pleasure and absence of pain or stress. So comfort has both physical and emotional dimensions and our most common areas of discomfort have to do with pain and of course, emotional stress. And it is an essential role of the nurse to promote basic care and comfort. So when we think about testing, especially standardized testing or NCLEX testing, basic care and comfort is a foundational concept that you must understand. Many health problems are caused by decreased comfort. So we can have acute discomfort, which is our short-term pain, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, um, or we can have chronic discomfort, which is long-term pain and stress. Now, the two interrelated concepts to comfort are going to be inflammation and, of course, pain. Okay, so what are risk factors for discomfort? So we know that there are physical risk factors and there are emotional risk factors. And we will talk a little bit more about those in the next um, slide, on the next couple of slides when we talk about pain. Physiologic consequences of discomfort. This is what makes discomfort such a big um, problem for patients or such a basic human need um, is the fight or flight mechanism. So remember our fight or flight response is what helps us cope with the source and the manifestations of discomfort. Um, the problem though, is when the response by our body is not successful. So our body initiates this fight or flight response and we don't respond as the body anticipates. And that's where we end up with persistent or chronic pain or anxiety related to prolonged stress. Now, from an assessment standpoint, our assessments are going to be subjective. We're gonna assess pain level, and then we're gonna assess stress and anxiety. Those are all subject, both are subjective assessments, meaning that the patient has to tell us the amount of stress, anxiety, or pain that they are feeling. We can't um, assess it with our five senses, which would make it an objective assessment. So comfort is definitely a subjective assessment. How do we um, prevent um, discomfort or what are ways that we promote comfort? So the best way that we can do this as a nurse is to anticipate situations that might cause pain or emotional stress. And then we can try to manage those situations to where, to where we either prevent the pain or stress or where we effectively manage it. Interventions that we use uh, to manage comfort are to alleviate pain, which we just talked about, um, alleviate emotional stress, and those are going to be dependent on us determining the source or the cause of the pain or stress. Okay, let's move on to pain. So pain, of course, is an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience. And of course, this is a subjective symptom, it, which is categorized as either acute or chronic. Chronic pain is sometimes call, also called persistent pain. Now, acute pain is very short term. Um, it's temporary. It typically is confined, confined to an injury. So a specific area of the body, it tends to be localized. Um, pain serves as a biologic response to activate our sympathetic nervous system and other physiologic responses. So there are things going on in the body that tell us that we are in pain. Therefore, we have those acute clinical manifestations that then can be treated. Chronic pain, on the other hand, that's that persistent pain that's going to last for more than three months. And it's often described as diffuse, meaning throughout the body. It's not necessarily confined to just one area of the body like acute pain is. So it's not localized. It's persistent and diffuse. It doesn't serve the same purpose as acute pain. So the purpose of acute pain is to alert us usually to an injury. However, 
A chronic pain doesn't serve that same purpose. And there are two types of chronic pain that we typically think about, which are persistent cancer pain and not uh, persistent non-cancer pain. There are some other ways that pain is categorized and that is gonna be nociceptive pain. This results from skin or organ damage or inflammation within the body. And then there's neuropathic pain that involves mechanisms related to the nervous system that can occur with or without tissue damage. So nociceptive pain, often I think about acute pain, right? So we've had an injury to the skin or an organ. Um, maybe you've been in a car accident and have a fractured uh, femur, or maybe you have acute appendicitis. Whereas neuropathic pain, that's that more diffuse pain um, that follows along nerve lines. You can have it um, even without any tissue damage, like in fibromyalgia. The interrelated concepts to pain are going to be inflammation and tissue integrity, because usually with acute pain, we do have some disruption in tissue integrity. Risk factors for pain, of course, for acute pain, we do think about trauma. So motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents, falling, um, anything that traumatizes the body can result in acute pain. Chronic pain, on the other hand, can come from chronic diseases like osteoarthritis, cancer, low back injury. Um, those are things that tend to take on a more persistent nature of pain. Physiologic consequences. So for acute pain, we already talked about that flight or fight response. So um, in acute pain, we do have that fight or flight response. Again, that is a sympathetic nervous system response. And we do send to tend to see sympathetic nervous system clinical manifestations. For example, nausea, vomiting, sweating, hypertension, tachypnea, tachycardia, dilated pupils. Those are all acute pain responses due to that fight or flight response. In chronic pain, remember we don't have a fight or flight response. So these are usually psychosocial issues such as anxiety or depression, um, that, uh, that are brought about by that acute or, per, I'm sorry, that chronic or persistent pain. As far as assessment for pain, always think about your PQRST assessment. So whether it's chronic or acute pain, we always want to do our PQRST assessment. So the P stands for what provokes the pain. So what is making it worse? The Q is what is the quality of the pain. Um, so how does the patient describe the quality of the pain? R is for radiate. How does, uh, does the pain radiate to another part of the body? S is severity. What is the severity of the pain? And for severity, we're often using a pain scale. Now, remember for young children, especially children um, under the age of three, we're going to need to use a behavior-based scale, possibly like the FLAC scale. However, once children hit age of three, we can use the Wong Baker Faces scale, which is what you see on the slide. And then of course, starting at age seven, we can use um, the traditional one through 10 scale. So that's going how, that is how we are going to assess the severity of the pain. And then the last assessment, T, what is the timing of the pain? Meaning when did it start? Um, how long has it lasted? Health promotion uh, strategies to prevent pain are going to really um, be prevention strategies for preventing trauma. So wearing um, protective equipment during uh, when playing sports, wearing a seatbelt, you know, when you're in a motor vehicle, avoiding high risk activities, or at least protecting yourself to the best of your ability while performing high risk activities. And then a big one for us as nurses is controlling surgical pain. So we um, will be talking um, later on in this series about uh, perioperative care and controlling surgical pain. We know that surgery um, always is accompanied by some degree of pain. And uh, it's really up to us as nurses to help control that surgical pain. Otherwise it um, evolves into persistent pain, which we don't want. Interventions to control pain or to manage pain. Of course, we have pharmacologic interventions and we have non-pharmacologic interventions. So pharmacologic are gonna be our analgesics. We have opioid analgesics like morphine and hydromorphone. And we have non-opioid analgesics um, like, uh, let's see, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, or Ketorolac. 
And then of course we also, and really important that we don't forget that we also have non-pharmacologic interventions. In fact, most research shows us that when we treat a patient's pain with both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions, patients usually have um, better satisfaction with pain control. So those non-pharmacologic interventions, and I've just listed a few, but um, guided imagery, acupressure, acupuncture, aromatherapy, but also distraction, um, guided imagery, um, focal points. Those are all things that we use, heat, cold, to manage pain that are non-pharmacologic. Okay, so hopefully this discussion on the basic core concepts of comfort and pain was helpful to you. Of course, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or to leave a comment down below. You can always reach me on my email, um, which is listed on the screen or on my Twitter account. Again, remember that I will link the previous three core concepts videos in the description box below, as well as all of the case studies that go along with previous videos and this video if you're interested. Have a wonderful day and hopefully I will see you next time in the next core concepts video.